The following is a CSPN Media podcast presentation. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, or whenever you are listening to this episode of Wheeling and Dealing. Uh, my name is Neil Carter. I'm Valusa Thompson. And you're listening to, I guess this is episode three, Valusa. They, they, they wanted us up until this point. CSPN didn't kick us out. So, know. you know, we are, you know, we're bringing the, you know, we're bringing the heat, I guess, as they say, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the kids are saying these days, uh, but uh, we're going to go with that. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right by me, Neil. Like, it's cool lingo for me. That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. So, um, obviously, we took a little bit of an unfortunate hiatus. We uh, had a few different things going on, and we apologize, but we are back in the swing of things. Obviously, uh, there has been a lot been happening uh, while we were uh, on a little bit of a break. Uh, but now we are back, and uh, we're going to bring everybody up to speed with the news and notes of these past few weeks. So let's get started with our first segment. What did the Fortified Administration do this week? And, uh, you know, what haven't they done? It seems that once again, once again, Melissa, we are uh, at a point where a, another administration official has stepped down. It usually happens on a Friday. <laughs> this Look, happened on a Friday. <laughs> they like the long weekend to start. That's all it is. We, got, we see we see what's going on. We see. We see. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, now former uh, Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price stepped down after numerous uh, counts against him of frivolous, frivolously using taxpayer-funded dollars to travel for him and his wife. I'm sorry, him and his wife to travel around the world on business and personal trips. Um, here's the thing. While... Uh, this is unfortunate, uh, and while this is the one time this situation has happened, Tom Price is not unique in this situation. The Veterans Affairs Secretary, there was an article that came out about that secretary. There was an uh, article over this weekend, I think, about uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Min- uh, Mnuchin. Um, and I'm curious, Felissa, as to your thoughts about this consistent misuse of funds for all of these so-called business executives that are friends of 45 that are just willfully ignorant to the fact that they think they can just get away with using taxpayer dollars frivolously and travel around the world on private planes. Well, I don't think that they're ignorant. I think that they are the willing victims of white privilege and thinking that they can get away with anything and... Um, just really not think that the rules apply to them. You know, it really boggles my mind that you, that Price would think that he and his wife could just take these trips and no one would say anything. As if the as if the administration isn't already under a microscope of what they do, even though there isn't much going on to really hold them accountable. But people are paying attention. So it's really kind of hilarious that rich people think that they can get away with anything um, because their friend has this position. I just you know, it's going to be this revolving door of people who behave badly in their position and are ashamed for doing so and are either forced or quote unquote willing, willingly um, resign. Um, right. You know, to me, I say good riddance because the way that the things are running, we need all the money that we have to keep this um, machine going and we can't have anybody, you know, misusing funds for their own personal gains. But I hate to say it. I don't think this will be the last time we will see someone go down for doing something that they know they shouldn't be doing. Right, especially as it pertains to something as uh, severe as misuse of funds. Um, But then again, we're talking about a president that hasn't released any of his tax returns (laughs) besides two pages of a random year um, that Rachel Maddow got up in a tizzy about, and she literally tried to stop the internet for people to focus, which I thought was a little ridiculous. It seemed 
too much like a ratings grab and nothing else because yeah. both of the forums that she ended up uncovering had literally nothing on them in terms of uh, things that could uh, be used against 45. Yeah, it was um, a useless media stunt for me. Like, that's how I took it. I watched it live and, and I was like, oh, I could have used this time to watch something more important. <laughs> you know, exactly. so uh, she, she didn't really do anything that was spectacular to really hold him accountable and get us really riled up. She just got us riled up for, like you said, two pages that told us nothing. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, I don't think that we should be surprised that, you know, a man who refuses to, you know, share this information that has been willingly shared by other presidents, for him to not have people in his court who have the same mentality that, you know, I can do whatever I want, nobody can hold me accountable, you know, but like a better phrase, screw you and the rest of the peasants that I'm supposed to be uh, working for or have put or have allowed me to be in this position or wants me to do right by the position that I'm in. Right. right. Exactly. And, you know, obviously, and, and speaking of this position, if, you know, if we can, uh, you know, obviously uh, tr uh, Tom Price has resigned and uh, there have been a lot of names floated around as far as who's going to replace him. Mm -hmm. uh, two of the names that have come up are uh, former Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal uh, and former uh, Pennsylvania Senator uh, Rick Santorum, who <laughs> makes the rounds on CNN um, talking about how great Trump is. So, uh, you know. Um, Neither of them are replacements, in my opinion. Well, if you Google Santorum, obviously I'm not going to tell you what the, what what the result is, but it's not Rick Santorum that is the first result when you Google his last name. So, <laughs> um, uh, you know, but that didn't stop him from uh, continuing on his, uh, you know, infamous career. Um, no. Obviously, uh, Bobby Jindal uh, is uh, left uh, the state of Louisiana in shambles from an economic standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the really, I mean, Trump really has the pick of the litter in terms of you know, do, you know, do I want to pick a former senator who hasn't been relevant in Washington in a very long time, who's just been a political yes man for me on CNN? Or do I want to pick a guy who uh, left his state in economic shambles and they're still recovering, even being after being hammered by uh, multiple hurricanes recently? And they're right now the Gulf is being hammered by uh, uh, Tropical Storm Nate. So, you know, again, I'm just, <laughs> I, I obviously don't want to stick on this issue, but, uh, but we're, we're at a point as far as this administration is concerned. Well, yes, there are a lot of things going on at once. It seems like we're in a constant state of a shell game with this administration because, you know, when the Tom Price situation happens, then we're not focused on, um, you know, Trump's uh, string of tweets at three o'clock in the morning about whatever mm -hmm. um but you know we're not talking about his un speech where he called the leader of north korea rocket man which is not only which is not only disrespectful to elton john but yeah. but, yes. but you know <laughs> it heightens the um uh, flares of nuclear war mm -hmm. and really turn the dial uh, for the uh, nuclear clock. So, you know, again, um, not, and then not to mention the fact that there are still administration positions that still haven't been filled. Right. You know, we're going to talk later on the show about the uh, two massive hurricanes that are, you know, all but destroyed the Caribbean islands and mm -hmm. how the peoples in both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands are still recuperating. Uh, you know, the island of uh, Bar the, the island of Barboa is gone. Or, yeah. or I'm sorry, Barbuda is gone, completely gone. So when and for 100 plus days, we didn't have a FEMA director, and now all of a sudden we do. And this guy is literally thrown into the lion's den um, mm -hmm. with all that's happening in the southern part of the country. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, um, we could talk for days about what. The, you know, what the 45 or Trump administration has done this week, because it seems like literally, you know, literally as we are recording, something is going on with that administration. There was, yes. you know, there was a football game today where 
uh, Vice President Pence tweeted a picture out where he, um, it wasn't even a current picture, he tweeted a picture where he went to a Colts game from two years ago and tried to pass it off as a picture from a game, that, as if he was there today. Now the problem with that is he was in a suit today, and he also left as soon as the, um, as soon as the uh, national anthem was over with. He didn't stay for the game. But he still tweeted this picture out in a completely different outfit in the stands as if he was there. So, and again, that picture is two years old. So well, there's we don't so have much Google that can what, search for things. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> and, but see, it's not only that. It's a matter of the fact that we are stuck in a period with this administration where, they're, where we're getting consistently flooded with misinformation and misdirection mm -hmm. and so many stories at once. I mean, I don't know if you follow uh, The Hill on Twitter, but I do. And they are literally tweeting a story about the administration almost every 15 minutes. Yeah. And I can remember when, the, when you know, 45 was sworn in and all of the tumultuous situations that happened prior, you know, leading up to him being sworn in, um, they, were, they were literally tweeting a story every five minutes. And now, they're tweeting a, and now they have stories posted every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we're at a point where it's literally information overload. Yes, it is. <laughs> it just feels like, you know, as a social worker, we talk about, you know, being overwhelmed and having all these little fires. And we don't have like a little stove fire. We have enormous, you need all the gallons of water and a helicopter to put it out fires. And it, every day, and it's so overwhelming. Like, I know that for me, you know, of course, with the podcast, I try to keep up with everything. But it's overwhelming. It's like, what in the heck is going to happen today? And we have all these fires, and then we have all these things with distractions, like with Pence and the football game today. That's a distraction. Like, that is so irrelevant to what's going on, but that's what the administration wants. It wants us to be distracted so that we will not pay close attention to what they're doing and hold them accountable. But exactly. there's so much, you know, fake news, real news, and you're like, well, what, what the hell do I give my time and my anger and outrage to? Like, you can only be angry and disgusted, but so long without feeling burnt out and feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, like, I can't believe this is happening. We haven't even made a whole year meal. And we got three more. How are we going to make three more? Exactly. And, and speaking of distraction and speaking of stories that get lost in the weeds, didn't something happen with uh, CHIP this week? Yes. Um, Congress allowed the Children's Health Insurance pro uh, Program, also known as CHIP, to lapse at the end of September. Um, CHIP covers not only children nationwide, but Congress is responsible for renewing CHIP. States um, in the result are being cut off from additional funding that helps lower to middle income families. Um, I just... I just feel that this administration and then the Congress are both so irresponsible. You know, you have a job to do, you know, and I think that they forget that the people, us, those who vote, or even those that do not vote, but who reside in this country are their bosses and they are the, they are the employees and we have the power to vote them out, but they don't care about that. And how do you allow children in this example to go without this program, to go without insurance? Like, I don't get how Congress is allowing itself to be distracted by so many things that are irrelevant. I know we'll get to, you know, um, you know, something later in the show about the healthcare battle that has been you no know, wage. You know, the Congress is not doing its part to hold the administration accountable to get things done, and yet they're allowing things like chip to slip through the cracks. That's going to affect our most, you know, what we call our most important resource or important population, which is children. But we do not protect children enough. We do not care about them having the health resources that they need to thrive and be successful. And, of course, support families to ensure that their children have the access that they need. You know, what are we really doing here? You know, how can you allow this significant program to, um, to not be renewed so that people can have this basic human right to get their access to what they need? I don't get that at all. And it's just frustrating for me as a social worker who knows about why all this stuff is so important, you know, particularly for, you know, low-income families. This is the only way that their children can have, you know, health care. And you're taking the one thing that they need so that their children can go to the doctor, you know, and 
get medicine and other resources. You know, I just don't get how we say one thing and do another, but that's the history of this country. Right. Exactly. Now, you know, speaking of the history of this country and speaking about reading in particular, obviously we'll bring this up later on in the show um, about what we're reading, but I will be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the sponsor of our show, one, one of the sponsors of our show, because we are, we are going to have more coming soon, um, and that's Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Uh, get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash wheel deal pod over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And obviously we want you to follow us, uh, you know, on our Twitter account at wheel deal pod. We saw a lot of folks interacting with us. So thank you for doing that. Um, although our email inbox is still barren. People don't email us. I don't know why that, you know, people are tweeting at us all the time. So please, if you have any questions or concerns or things you want to see on the show, please email us at wheeldealpod at cspn.us. We obviously appreciate the love we're getting on Twitter. Uh, We appreciate the amount of listens that we're getting. But please, you know, hit us up on email. Yeah, hit us up. I'll talk to you all. And, you know, thank you all who have mentioned us on your podcast. I know that we got a mention on T with Queen and Jay um, last week on their podcast podcast so thank you all for supporting this show you know in the early stages we greatly appreciate it we do want y'all to email us so get on that and don't be sending us spam because that will get deleted you will get blocked you will catch a fade real quick trust <laughs> and believe <laughs> so let's roll into a segment I love all politics is local so obviously, on a somewhat, uh, on a well, not somewhat, but a certainly a somber uh, note as far as local is concerned. Uh, in Las Vegas, there was a uh, the largest mass shooting in American history uh, over the weekend. Um, and while everyone would be quick to say, "Well, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to the families affected," obviously. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the to the families that were affected. Uh, over 50 people were uh, heinously uh, taken from this earth, um, and over I think 400 were injured. Um, we also need to talk about action items, and one of those action items is not um, something minimal like bump stocks, but uh, major action as it relates to uh, assault weapon bans. And really, assault weapon fines. Um, I think there. I think there's been a, n- a number of articles, and the list of correct me if I'm wrong, but there's been a number of articles that have come out that said that the shooter, who I'm not going to justify with mentioning his name, but the shooter um, purchased something like 77 guns between three different states. Yeah. And th- to purchase that amount of guns, and there's no registry associated with the guns that are purchased. And there's no, yes, I know there is registry in certain states, depending on the size of the magazine, depending on the make and model of the gun, and things of that nature, because it's tracked via the serial number. But if someone can purchase that amount of guns, 77 guns, and there's no registry to ping in these other states where they're purchased, for them to say, well, wait a second, you purchased 30 guns in this state, why am I going to sell you an additional 10 more? Right. I mean, you know... This shooting, uh, you know, affected so many people in so many different ways. Obviously, there are a number of uh, national organizations that, um, against gun violence in all of its forms, uh, that have come out and said, you know, you know, they've kind of reiterated the point. When are we going to talk about gun violence? And I feel like every time there is a mass shooting of a, 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 a you know, a shooting of any kind, may, that statement is almost a broken record because that's set in a silo. And the people who need to have the conversation are outside of that silo. So they're focused on not paying attention and still buying those guns. And then you have the people that are inside the silo just repeating it to each other. When are we going to talk about it? When are we going to talk about it? And pointing the fingers. Because as I'm sure you felt, Melissa, um, you know, when it is no matter what race the person is, um, but particularly if the shooter happens to be white, the first thing 
that comes out is, well, is there some sort of mental health, mm-hmm. quote unquote, issue? Right. Um, and, and it's always amazing that white men particularly can be labeled as someone who has a quote unquote mental health issue. But if they're a person of color, they get deemed a terrorist, a thug, so on and so forth. And there's no questioning about whether the act is a domestic terror or not. You know, um, you know, I know that for this particular shooting, I had someone who was there. Luckily, they were okay. But it really, being that close to home, it really, you know, really upsetting that we don't have any type of system where we can track, you know, what you were saying, you know, somebody purchasing you know, an absurd number of um, weaponry that you know, can't be traced. And we're still having this conversation after countless of mass shootings that has occurred in this country. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of tired of, of, of us having the conversation. Because for me, we're not going to do anything. And I think that's a reality that we don't want to um, see the writing on the wall for. And, we're, and to your point, we're, no action will certainly be taken when most of the members of Congress are bought and sold by the NRA. Mm-hmm. And, this, and, this, and, th- and this is not a outright attack on the National Rifle Association. I have a lot of friends who, are, who have been card-carrying members of the National Rifle. I have friends and family members who have been national, who have been members of the NRA for decades. I have grandparents that were members of the NRA. So, mm-hmm. it's not, so the NRA is in my blood, but I also understand and know from working in politics for as long as I have, that the NRA, on a, especially on a federal level, or the quote-unquote gun lobby, has their hands on so many elected officials at literally every level of government, from president, to Congress, to governors, to state reps, to city council members, to mayors, to mm-hmm. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Mm-hmm. And if you really did your due diligence and followed the money. And this is not to say that everyone should drop what they're doing, stop the podcast, go on to opensecrets.org and um, see where the money is. Because, you know, Open Secrets only tracks federal money. They don't track local money. So um, as, as far as, but specifically as far as that money is concerned, there's so much money in the, uh, in these elected officials from the, you know, from the gun lobby and from the NRA that they really aren't going to do anything because they've all been bought and sold by the NRA. Right. And money talks. We should know, particularly, you know, on the Hill, you know, many of our politicians are bought before they're able to get their seat warm. So I think that we need to be very realistic to the fact that your, your representative, who you may love, who you may think is stellar, they all have a price. And when it comes to this particular issue, that price it's, it's more important to some of them than doing the right thing and getting action done. And I think that's, you know, for me and probably some of the other, that's the hard pill to swallow is that money matters more than doing right by the people to protect us from individuals from getting all these guns that are unnecessary to have. I'm not against guns, but you don't need to have military style, you know, machinery in your home when there's no need for that. Right. You know, um, so I think that we need to be realistic as to every time this happens, until we get politicians that cannot be brought, we're not going to do anything about this issue. And to me, where does the conversation go once we kind of have that real, realistic understanding? Where do we go from there? Do we just stop, you know, talking about it? Like, what, what do we do at that point? And I think that's something we may need to, that we really do need to heavily consider because. You know, we have a president that's going to protect the right to bear arms and who have following that is adamant about that. So what are we really going to get done over the next soon to be three years after we get this one down about this issue? Because this is not, to your point, th- this is not going to be the end of low, large scale or small scale shootings because mm-hmm. the because because military style weapons are so easily accessible and because this registry is only uh is 
allowed in some states and partial in others, mm-hmm. um, it is in, it is so easy to get you know all these kinds of weapons so easily. All you literally have to do is be of a certain age, have a driver's license, um, and in some states, you have to have a driver's license. You have to have a certain number of uh, a certain amount of cash um, or credit and uh, the capacity to uh, and, 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 and a history of weapons because they don't do a, you know, these gun store owners. And, and if you go to a convention, they don't do mental health checks. Mm-hmm. There, there aren't even mental health checks on the gun store. Like no one ever goes to the uh, gun store owners before, during or, or, or the gun convention folks before, during or after a shooting other than to say, why did you let them buy these weapons? Mm-hmm. They don't do the, the, the necessary mental health check on these folks to wonder how they had the capacity to own the gun store or the run the gun convention in the first place. Right. So there, so, so there needs to be a conversation centered around that as well, as far as prevention and uh, registry is concerned as well. Um, And I do want to make one last statement is that we really have to stop with the ableism when it comes, when we bring up gun control and mental illness, because it is very tiring and offensive to say that, particularly when it's white men, they do have a mental illness. You know, majority of those with mental illness are not a danger to you and I, you know, they're more likely to harm themselves than going out here and harming others. So we really need to be vigilant and rejecting that narrative about people with mental illness, whether suspected, whether actual, whether it's, you know, placed on them because of their race, um, really being careful about that narrative, how it harms those who actually do have uh, psychiatric disabilities, mental disabilities, and the way that we view and misunderstand um, their disabilities. But I think, you know, that conversation always comes up, and I know that members and in the disabled community are you know, constantly writing about it, tweeting about it, you know, every time this happens. And I know that it's very stressful and triggering for many in the community when this dialogue comes up. So just do be mindful of the propaganda uh, that, that you may share, that you may discuss when it comes to this topic, because that's something that we really need to be more proactive to not ostracize a group of people with the wrong information about who they are. Exactly. I could not have said that better myself. I was going to mention it, but you already did. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of health, um, and I actually want to bring in uh, a third voice on this, um, mm-hmm. who's been listening on the sidelines, uh, sp- speaking about healthcare, because this is because healthcare affects everybody. It doesn't just affect people who are sick. It affects people in many different spaces. And I wanted to bring this third voice on because you know, this issue is not, again, it's not a single person issue. It's not a, just a family issue. It's not a, uh, you know, recently married issue. You know, healthcare affects everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, obviously the uh, Graham Cassidy bill uh, was, uh, the, the Graham Cassidy version, uh, re- repeal and replace of ACA recently came through. And uh, Classic, I know you've been on the sidelines uh, as a producer of the show, but I'm curious. Um, you know, we usually don't have your voice on the show, but I wanted to <laughs> get your input. And I, know, and I know I put you on the spot here, brother, and I apologize. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, like I said, this issue affects everyone. Health, you know, whether, whether you're sick, whether you're 100% healthy, whether you think you're healthy, you're probably not. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we've seen... 30 plus versions of the ACA repeal fail at this point in the Obama administration and now in the Trump administration. So um, as someone who I'm assuming is on their jobs, healthcare, as I'm assuming, and, and I know you're married. So you're, so I, I know, I know you and your wife may be on your healthcare. You don't have to go into explicit detail if you don't, if you choose not to, but I'm curious as someone like myself who is married, who is on uh, Medicare right now, I'm curious what your thoughts are as far as, you know, where we are with healthcare and who it affects, how it affects, and really how draconian this particular bill actually was. 
Yeah, uh, and thanks for having me on again. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to affect a lot of us in terms of the uh, the choice that we can make uh, as far as or the choices that we have in front of us. Of course, a lot of us that may, you know, work those regular, you know, th- that might work that nine to five job. You know, you get the health insurance through your uh, employer uh, or, you know, certain options through your employer. And, uh, you know, so you feel as if, you know, you pretty much are covered. But uh, without you know, without a specific option or without certain options like Medicare, and Medicaid uh, for those that uh, are in need or those that are in poverty or something like a, a Affordable Care Act, would actually, which actually has created that option. Um, what happens is the prices are going to go up or the, uh, you know, the requirements go up on private insurance. And uh, so, you know, with people that uh, have private insurance, it affects them as well as people that, you know, these programs are here for. It affects them as well. Uh, you know, and, and then when you get to the point where, you know, you might not always be employed, you know, you might not always have access to those options or uh, in particular, and this was a hot button t- issue with Obamacare, uh, with small businesses we we're concerned, where a lot of them were saying, well, you know, now that the, you know, now that there's more in the marketplace, I'm going to have to pay more, uh, you know, to basically have carry, uh, you know, insurance. And so I've got to make that decision whether to hire people or, you know, because I need to have insurance or not. And, uh, you know, so really putting an attack on that is unfair to a lot of uh, Americans. And uh, what it does is it really puts us at a great disadvantage. And the only, you know, the only folks that really benefit from this are those big healthcare companies, which honestly they make enough money as it is. Mm -hmm. And not only that, and thank you, uh, uh, for chiming in, but and, and not only that, um, there, 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 for me, it's a matter of principle because we've again seen um, a attempt at a repeal over thirty times between now two presidential administrations, and while I've said on many an occasion, either on this podcast or uh, on my Twitter account, or if you've talked to me in person. The ACA is by no means perfect. Mm -hmm. I am a big fan and big supporter of not only um, a single payer option, which is what was originally introduced by some of the more progressive members of Congress um, when the ACA was trying to go through initially, uh, but also um, expanding Medicare, um, whether it's a Medicare for all or just expanding Medicare in general. Um, There, there's not enough attention, in my opinion, paid to Medicare because what ends up happening is everyone gets focused on um, how much uh, things are going to cost um, mm-hmm. in terms of their uh, co-pays and things of that nature. And it's really aggravating for me <laughs> because what people don't realize is these healthcare companies are raising these copay costs, not because there's a lack of competition. Because if you go back to when the ACA was written, the healthcare industry played a role in the creation of the ACA. So there's a reason why whenever there's a repeal bill that comes out, and obviously Graham Cassidy was the most recent failure, um, there, you know, there's a reason why so many organizations line up against a repeal because they were actively involved in creating the ACA. So when you see, and I'm not talking about healthcare insurance companies, I'm talking about organizations like, uh, that, that protect the most marginalized at any age. Mm-hmm. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, Graham Cassidy has come and gone, and I think the writing is on the wall as to if there's going to be a, uh, another attempt at repealing the bill. Um, obviously, Melissa, I, I, you know, um, this, you know, this bill affected our community tremendously. And obviously our, you know, our friends at the, at, you know, at National Adapt were again on the mm-hmm. front lines. Um, uh, Colleen Flanagan and the rest of the folks at National Adapt were literally on the front lines when mm-hmm. the only hearing that happened in the Senate uh, for the Graham Cassidy bill happened, they literally were escorted out uh, forcibly by Capitol Police. And again, you had a situation where Capitol Police were um, heavy-handed in some gar- in, in some regards, and uh, heavy-handed in different 
in, and, and heavy handed in their emotions in other regards as it pertains to taking disabled people out of a hearing room when this bill, again, as Classic put it earlier, affects everybody. So, you know. No, um, this is basically disabled people doing what we do best. We advocate not only for ourselves, but for everyone else, because we know that if we save ourselves, we will save you too. And with this bill, you know, Lindsey Graham is my representative. Um, I know I said in the first episode, I do not believe in giving cookies because he did right, you know, with the, um, you know, the previous, um, and not voting for it when it came to the previous um, action to repeat right. on And now that he had his name on this one, and I'm like, this is not what I need you to do as my representative. I need you to work on the current health care bill, make it better than what it is, protect it, and do what right by your constituents. Um, you know, I'm glad to see it fail, and I hope that, and this may be wishful thinking, but this is the last attempt because we need them to do their job, i.e., instead of repealing the ACA, they should have renewed CHIP. That would have right, been right. great, you know, effort for them to have done, since that is a priority. Um, so, you know, it's really this whole bill, you know, would have, you know, uh, established things like the block grants that me and our community do not, you know, care for because of the limited funding that states would get, and also giving states this power to kind of, you know, um, decide how health care be run by the states. States can't get that right now. What makes you think they're going to be able to get that right if they had more control. So, you know, a lot of things in this bill was very scary for many of us to see it trying to come down a pipeline. And I just really wish that they would just get over the fact that the ACA is going to be here and they need to focus on other things that matter that we are seeking for them to do. And, you know, I just, you know, this Congress is just so, so frustrating but I am glad that we do have this victory. But I wish the fight was, was over. But I really feel like it's not. I don't think it's certainly over. But I, but I do think they do need to. I agree with you that they should uh, reestablish CHIP, also expand Medicare. And there's a host of other things that we could get into the weeds about. But we obviously don't have the time today. But speaking of Congress, I want to get into our, our next segment. All politics is theater. And speaking of Congress, <laughs> so so Pennsylvania 18, um, which is in the, the, the quote unquote heartland of the great state of Pennsylvania, um, recently had uh, their rep uh, announce his retirement or he resigned or, you know, he's saying he resigned. He told Paul Ryan he's retiring. It's he, he's leaving is the most important right. thing. Right. Uh, but why is incredibly interesting. <sighs> yes. Um, as I like to call it, it is do as I say, not as I do. Amen. <laughs> when, um, <laughs> when I saw the, um, the quote unquote controversy surrounding Murphy, um, basically he had an extramarital um, affair and he asked uh, the person he was involved with to have an abortion. And I really liked the comeback <laughs> by, um, by the person they were with about it uh, when they um, thought they had a pregnancy scare. And the quote that really got me was, and you have zero issue posting your pro-life stance all over the place when you had no issue asking me, when you had no issue asking me to abort our unborn child just last week when we thought that was one of the options. And they, um, Ms. Edwards texted Murphy this in late January. And I, you know, it's, to me, it's funny because you have these men who are making decisions. You have strong stances, probably stronger than a lot of women have when it comes to abortion. And here, in this case, Murphy is seeing that as an option to cover up his bad, quote unquote, bad deed. Um, I just, you, you can't help but laugh. Like, that's all I can do at it. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's comical at the end of the day that you have these, you know, particularly men who are stark at having control over women's bodies and saying what women should 
or should not do or what is life or what isn't life and what is moral and isn't moral. And they pick, they nitpick what they follow based on their Christian beliefs. And, you know, if you're a Christian, then you will know that cheating on your wife is not very um, uh, um, welcoming or appropriate. Right. So <laughs> I'm just, you know, stating it out there, you know, that's not, you know, good Christian like behavior and how you can be very stark in ensuring that your constituents do not have access to the resources that they need to make the adult and appropriate decisions for their life and for the situation while you are here ensuring that you have that choice for your own self is very selfish and, um, not surprisingly contradictory for these type of men like Mur- Murphy, who doesn't have a good reputation anyway with their stance on mental illness and um, the policies they've been trying to enact in that realm. So really shouldn't be surprising that someone of that caliber would um, go back and forth on, on certain issues. Right. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but when I read the article in the Post-Gazette, um, One of the things I was waiting for for his mistress to say, but she didn't say it, but I'm sure she was thinking it, is, you know, suck my ass from the back. Um, (laughs) Which he probably would have enjoyed. Um, Everybody uh, got a kink, Neil. Everybody got a kink. I know. I know. (laughs) I know. Eat their booty like groceries, right? Just like the song says. But anyway. Yeah, that's what the children are saying. (laughs) (laughs) And the adults, let's be clear. Because because we see it very much. And, um, you know, uh, you know, Representative uh, Murphy, um, or former Representative Murphy, in I guess in a few months, um, obviously has <laughs> uh, a, a number of questionable stances, and this announcement and the reason why is pretty hilarious. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hilarious because he's had str- such a strong stance, as you so eloquently put it, Melissa, against. Um, reproductive issues for such a long time. Um, he's, you know, he's a member of the pro-life caucus. He's tried to push um, anti-abortion legislation. He's been a card-carrying vote against uh, Planned Parenthood getting funding. He's tried to strip Planned Parenthood from funding and attach it to bills that had nothing to do with Planned Parenthood. Um, so it's just interesting and kind of almost karma that uh, this incident happened to him. Um, and, you know, obviously everyone is talking about positioning going forward as far as PA-18, where does it fall? Um, is it going to swing to the Democrats or the Republicans in 2018? Right now, as of today, there's only three Democrats, for those that are keeping score or who want to, there are three Democrats who filed that were, that were going to run against Tim Murphy um, one of the three was going to win and run against him and, and, you know, run against him in the general election. There's no Republicans who filed because it, because the NRC was uh, convinced that he was going to just run free election. Obviously just like uh, speaker Ryan had no idea. The NRC had no idea either that this was going to come out. So, um, you know, uh, we'll see what happens uh, as far as if a Republican files in that, uh, particular district, it's likely that they will, but as of today, uh, as of this recording, no one has filed. So, yeah, <laughs> that's really all we're going to say about Representative, or former Representative Murphy. The jokes write themselves, Neil. I think that's, I that's all that is to be said. The jokes write themselves when it comes to things like this. Pretty much. So let's get to our next segment, which okay. is the unsung hero of the week. An unsung hero of the week. Now, obviously, as we talked about earlier in the show, um, we made mention of the, of FEMA not having a director. We also made mention of the you know that right now it's the well it's the end of hurricane season now but or it's nearing the end of hurricane season now i don't, I don't want to make light of the fact that tropical storm nate is still hitting the gulf coast but um we've had a string of hurricanes almost in succession of each other hit the same area um 
but the largest was the largest to hit the um, Caribbean was uh, Maria. Um, the largest to hit Houston, Texas, was Irma. Um, and then there were a few smaller hurricanes in between that. I have friends in the Houston area. I have friends in Florida that were, that were affected by Irma going. Irma literally went through the entire state of Florida. Um, and I have friends all up and down Florida that were affected, displaced, um, and are now rebuilding. Uh, so, you know, obviously. But, but I also have family in the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. I have friends and family and other loved ones in Puerto Rico. So, um, obviously, when Irma, I'm sorry, when Maria went through the Caribbean, um, it did devastating damage. And I believe, as of this recording, 90% of Puerto Rico is still without power. Most of the island is still without running water. I don't know what the percentages are for the Virgin Islands um, as of today, but, I but they are probably along the same lines. As we mentioned earlier, certain outlying islands that are not U.S. territories um, have completely been uh, destroyed and nearly wiped out. Um, so everyone is literally rebuilding. Uh, and huh, it's, uh, it's tough to talk about because, as I said, I have friends who... Friends, family, loved ones who live in that area who are affected by, to this day, still, you know, still being affected by the effects of Hurricane Maria. And well, whether they're in the Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico. And obviously I don't want to make light of the fact that it hit Jamaica and it hit Barbados. It hit the Dominican Republic. It, the, the, the Dominican Republic, it hit Cuba. Um, I, I don't want to make light of the fact that it, that, because it, did, you know, that it missed all these non-U.S. territories, so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not. I, I, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what many folks do, which is they only talk about the U.S. territories, and that's all they care about. And some even take it a step further. They don't even. They, up until recently, you know, and this is what aggravates me is people didn't think that Puerto Rico was a U.S. territory. Right. So when Puerto Rico was hit from Hurricane from Hurricane Juan, Hurricane Maria, and Hurricane Irma. Um, but obviously Hurricane Maria did the most damage. Americans that were in the, in, in the 50 United States, some were saying, why are we, you know, who, you know, who cares what happens to Puerto Rico? They're not a part of the United States. They're the other. They're just an island that I get to go to if, you know, I want to spend my vacation. I didn't know they were Americans. I'm sure they would say the same thing about the island of Hawaii. That is a that is a state. Now we're not going to get into the weeds, and you know we will have a future podcast with representatives from Puerto Rico and the and the and the U.S. Virgin Islands to talk specifically about relief efforts in both of those areas because that's important to highlight them and have them on. Um, and I don't want to take away from our unsung hero, but what I do want to say is that it is imperative that we recognize that that area was. Uh, the effects of three hurricanes hitting that same area are so catastrophic that both those areas need tremendous amounts of support. And I'm not just talking about thoughts and prayers. I'm talking about money. I'm talking about manpower. I'm talking about whatever you have the capacity to give. If you are, if you have the capacity to give to help them. And I'm not, and I'm not just limiting that to the Caribbean islands. Obviously, Houston is still rebuilding. Obviously, there's parts of Florida that are still rebuilding. And the Gulf Coast right now is being hit by Tropical Storm Nate. So again, there's different ways you can donate. We are not a Red Cross supporter, so we're not going to suggest that you donate to the Red Cross. There are programs and funds that we will highlight in our show notes that you can, for all of the affected areas that you can donate to. But, I, but you know, <laughs> and... Liz, I apologize for kind of taking the thunder out of our unsung hero because she oh. does deserve to be lifted up. Um, no, this but is I think, go ahead. very important because I know that, um, you know, this is something especially, you know, that's very important to hear because when it comes to the lives of people of color, you know, when we, you know, in, you know, nations that are, you know, affected, 
they are not giving the attention that they need. And I know that in our community, there's been a lot of attention and work being done, particularly in Puerto Rico, um, to get disabled Puerto Ricans the resources and support that they need. Um, disabled Puerto Ricans, you know, and you know, without a disaster, you know, are not always receiving the support that they need to thrive. And I know that since um, Maria has happened, you know, I know I've been learning more about that, and has been quite surprised at the lack of supports that are available for many. Um, there and now with the um, disaster that has occurred that has been exacerbated. So I know members of our community have gone to Puerto Rico to assist in the relief efforts. Um, some of them are documenting their um, journey online, through video, through blogging, etc. And many of our community have been assisting for providing uh, either money or um, providing um, supplies that are being requested so you know no act is too small you know if you want to be a part of helping people regain whatever that may have lost um, so I really think that you know and also learn, learning about people who are in that area I know that I have friends who have you know have you know shared you know when it came to Irma and Maria what has happened and then worry about their family so you know this has been a very close to home issue you know, for the both of us and seeing people, you know, figuring out what they can be done and hearing about what is currently going on. So it's um, a very sombering uh, matter at this point and more needs to be done. And, you know, and I'm, you know, I think we're both very grateful for what is, you know, what people have stepped up to do. But, you know, it would be nice for government to really do their job in providing assistance to those who need it and to really step up to the plate because it hasn't done that um, thus far with any of these storms that has um, come through in the matter of, you know, weeks. So um, it's just very, um, it's very heavy, you know, on the heart to see, you know, everything going on. And it's back to back to back with little breathing room to even try to regroup and to uh, rebuild. So, right. um, you know, it just, you know, a lot, and it's really discouraging that the media hasn't really done its part to give the coverage of what it needs, and for the little that it has done, it hasn't been justifiable to really discuss the true impact of what's happening. And speaking of that, we have a clip from Now This News uh, that we're going to play real quick about the what's been going on uh, down there. Oh, he's kind of, sort of like a uh, miscommunicator-in-chief. The, the tone and the tenor of what was being said and the way it was being said was celebratory. It was like they'd, they'd finished a mission and they were there to celebrate it and toast to it. Meanwhile, as you point out, there's devastation right outside the door of where he was sitting. This terrible and abominable view of him throwing paper towels and throwing provisions at people, it's really, it, it does not embody the spirit of the American nation. That is not the land of the free and the home of the brave. Can you imagine if we were covering President Barack Obama visiting a hurricane uh, zone, an area devastated by a hurricane, and Barack Obama had been throwing rolls of paper towels at hurricane victims? To me, it's, it's almost like we've lost our sense of what is purely outrageous coming from this president anymore. We spent a lot of our time talking to first responders who were saying, why do you say we're not working? Why do you say that we're not down here to help? Nobody has reported that, Mick, and it's dangerous to do that. Not only is it a distraction, no, it's not, it's not, it's it's not dangerous. politically, let, 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 let me answer, but it, let me it answer makes your people if, not if, believe the need. The need is real. That's not just the bad stuff, it's the reality, Mick. I hate to tell you, Puerto Rico, but you've thrown our budget a little out of whack. Really? <laughs> We, I mean, would we like to go down the list? I mean, how much his tax cuts are going to end up costing the country? And it will cost how the country. How about just accommodating his it, family's it, private jets? If you just, yeah, talk about his family's private jets. And his administration's private jets. This was a PR 17-minute meeting. There was no exchange with anybody, with none of the mayors. Everybody around this table and everybody watching can really be very proud of what's taken place in Puerto Rico. Now, uh, obviously, our unsung hero is uh, the mayor of San Juan, uh, 
Carmen Cruz. Um, she has, you know, when, you know, when she's not trudging through, uh, hurricane slash sewer water to rescue people, not just in the city of San Juan, but in the outlying cities in the state, you know, in the island of Puerto Rico, on the island of Puerto Rico, um, she's sleeping on a cot. Her home was completely destroyed. So she's literally, when, you know, when she's not rescuing people, she is uh, taking time to go on uh, national news um, and literally talk about how much of a support is needed in the state of Puerto Rico, you know, in Puerto Rico. Um, and I nearly slipped and said state, and I think it should be a state, but that's, again, a separate conversation for a separate podcast. Um, she's been uh, complimentary uh, of the administration for a few days, um, but then Trump also tweeted that uh, uh, before he came uh, earlier this week to Puerto Rico, where he was literally did almost nothing to help the people in Puerto Rico besides throwing some paper towels like a, like he was at a fucking carnival game. Um, he took to Twitter uh, earlier that week, or earlier last week, and um, said that the mayor of San Juan was doing everything she can except helping people. Um, by going on the news, she was he said that she was told by Democrats to attack him, which was false. Um, there was there were there was no coordinated efforts between her and the Democratic Party to attack. Uh, Trump. Um, it was she was angry at what what she was angry and sad about what wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. And no matter who was president, she would have and because of their inaction, she would have come at them because these are her people. Right. So, you know, um, the spectacle of his comments, coupled with the throwing of the. Uh, Towels, and I know classic. I'm bringing you back on to talk about this because before the recording, we, you know, we were jokingly talking about the memes that were going around of uh, Trump, uh, you know, throwing these uh, paper towels to, uh, you know, Puerto Rican residents. Yeah. Um, I, and uh, thanks for having me back on again. Uh, it's two times in one episode. This is great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the memes on online on Twitter, and I hate to give attention to this, but it it, it, it did kind of capture you know a, a, a lot of obviously a lot of the meme makers. Um, so Trump's basically shooting or like kind of doing the basketball shot, uh, you know, flipping his wrist uh, with the towels, uh, paper towels out to the crowd in uh, Puerto Rico, and so it basically, a lot of people have basically put putting that meme against, like, say, um, Michael Jordan's famous shot over Craig Elo in the playoffs, and so Jordan's, like, doing that same, uh, or Trump's doing the same shot, or 45 is also shooting over uh, Byron Russell in the NBA Finals, that kind of thing, or uh, he's at the three-point contest, uh, and he's pretty much shooting paper towels into the, uh, into the three, you know, as three-pointers, and so that's been kind of, uh, that kind of took the the Twitter or the uh, meme universe by storm a little bit, uh, but again, I don't want to give him too much credit because uh, it's this it's this uh, memification of forty five that's kind of helped get him into office in the first place, make him seem right. like a joke and familiar right. rather than just you know the the clown buffoon and yeah, well, pretty much everything else that he is, and it's really a serious matter. But yeah, um, doing jump shots or set shot paper towels into the crowd is not really helping much uh, as far as aid and relief to, uh, you know, to, to people that are suffering pretty much U S citizens that are suffering overseas. So exactly. And, you know, we, 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 I think, and classic person are wrong, but, uh, but, uh, but I'm sure we'll hear more about those uh, terrible jump shots on uh know the score when they uh, record again. Right. Uh, may or may not. I don't think they do play of the week anymore, but uh, it's definitely not. <laughs> One of the plays of the week, uh, but yeah, tune into our CSPN shows. Uh, I'm sure Chronic Hours are going to touch on it, as as well as our other shows. Uh, but thanks for the uh, quick plug for, for other shows in the network. They definitely appreciate it. Of course, of course. Um, so you know, again, uh, you know, uh, 
she's she's viewed as a you know uh, Mayor Cruz is viewed as a powerful example of how women make great leaders. Um, what 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 exactly was her quote, Felissa? It is um, no matter what the problem, conflict, or crisis, the feminine leadership strength, passion, um, collaboration, peacemaking, bridge building are a vital part of the solution. More more than ever, we need women to step up to the leadership plate wherever they find themselves to call out inequity, to challenge uh, the established order, to engage in dialogue, and to hold up a mirror to those who have a vested interest in maintaining it. And that was basically the quote about why she's a powerful example, you know, of what women make great leaders. And for me, this whole thing is just very frustrating um, because he's making... 45 is making this about him. You know, it's so egotistical. Like, you think of somebody conspiring against you and you call them, you know, nasty, the whole, his continued use of women being nasty and, you know, saying that, um, you know, the um, Puerto Rico want everything done for them, you know, when it should be a community effort. I'm like, this woman is in her community. Like, she's right. telling people what's going on to her citizens. To her constituents, like they need help, they need resources. This is what's going on, and you're making it about you. And it's, you know, it's so frustrating that he cannot think of anyone beyond himself in something as devastating as this type of crisis to have some type of empathy or compassion to understand what's going on, to understand the magnitude of this and to really do his part and the nation's part to provide assistance so you know when i saw those tweets and the reaction to them and i believe that they were if i'm not mistaken deleted as what as well um it just the again going back to the distraction that i mentioned earlier of this president who's so who have his behind his have his head so far up his behind to not even one second, take it out to really see what's going on, you know, is is unbelievable. But I think that Mayor Cruz has been phenomenal, and I really love her snark and wearing, you know, uh, nasty, you know, shirt that people were talking about, nasty women's shirt, and you know, I just really feel that she's handled it, you know, better than I think any of us who would have helped, would have had to deal with someone of that magnitude, um, particularly as a woman. You know who you are in this leadership role, and you have a man who is nowhere near competent in his role, right? Um, criticizing you when you are literally on the ground looking after your people, doing for your people, call, creating attention and awareness about how your people are being incredibly affected. You know, and have to deal with this child, <laughs> you know, this childish behavior. You know, by someone who should know better. Um, I think she has um, shown incredible poise and also incredible pettiness that I really appreciate. And you know, in you know, in the t-shirt wearing and just really giving a voice for her people, and to not allow Forty Five to distract her from what she know needs to be done. Um, you know, this is some of the stuff that women in power have to endure. You know, what Trump has said something like that about a man, most likely not. You know, I'm just going to keep it real here. Um, but because she's a woman and she's a woman of color, he, in his mind, sees her as less than and, you know, and someone that he can just dismiss because she's not on his caliber. And, you know, this is the sexism at play when it comes to four to five. Um, sexism and racism at play when it comes to him. And, you know, I just, you know, I really think Mayor Cruz has done a phenomenal job in what she what she has been doing and to really stand up for herself because it takes a lot of courage for women to do that and to say what she needs to say and be unapologetic about it in the face of a sexist, racist person like Fort Five. Right. And I don't want to call him a person. Like he don't even deserve that dignity, but there are other choice words that I'm not going to say in the podcast. I mean, you can say them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> um, and, and I'm sure classic isn't all either. But, uh, 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 you know, uh, while he was in Puerto Rico, I don't want to 
miss the fact that he also took it upon himself to uh, uh, say that the Puerto Rican officials should be very, very proud that hundreds of people didn't die and that they're they weren't affected by a quote unquote real catastrophe like Katrina. When I, 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 I guess he must have forgotten when now Twitter didn't exist when Katrina hit the Gulf Coast and particularly uh, Louisiana and the lower parts of Mississippi. And there was complete dis and then there was inaction from the then Bush administration mm -hmm. as far as Katrina relief was concerned. If you remember, the, if, if folks remember, there was a flyover from President Bush before he even touched down uh, into what was affected or into the areas that were worse affected by uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. So um, to compare and contrast disasters that affected two different marginalized people almost to the same, almost to the same degree is egregious. I'm not going to give it any, you know, any other attention than what it needs to, because he's already on the record as saying it, and that's that. I'm not going to give it, you know, I really don't think we should give any more attention to it. I just wanted to make sure that it was mentioned, because folks seem to forget that he also had a press conference when he was there and made those ridiculous statements. Right. So obviously there's, um, in addition to assisting the general public, um, we're, we're going to list some ways in which the, uh, what, what the disabled community and how you can uh, help them specifically uh, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, we're going to make sure we list all of those uh, resources as well. The National Coalition of uh, Latinas with uh, Disabilities, um, or NCLD, uh, and I believe there's a few. Is there a few other organizations here? Yes, uh, they've been in ahead. partnership um uh, with a with a nonprofit to really take um, get people who want to act as volunteers to serve as a link to those to access the resources that they need. Um, I know Catherine Perez; she's the founder of NCLD, and you know uh, she's I believe NCLD is one of the few, if not the only, um, group or organization that focuses on the experience of disabled Latinx people and. Um, I know that they've been putting out statements and really trying to see how they can become more involved. And of course, disabled people, you know, when it's one of us, you know, it's all of us. And we try to do what we can to provide assistance, whether here or, you know, wherever that's, that is needed. So I know they've been, um, they've recently put out a statement as to what they're trying to do. And I know that there, there'll be more from them, you know, as the days, weeks, and months go forth in providing assistance. And I know that um, Center for Disability Rights have also been working with um, um, working in partnerships um, to get vital medical equipment to the, to the same people there. Um, I know that um, they've been supporting the efforts of Port Like Strategies, which is one of the few nonprofits that uh, provide assistance when it comes to disaster relief for disabled people. Um, and they've been hands on with every disaster that has happened over the past couple of weeks from Harvey, Irma, Na Maria, and I'm sure that. Um, when Nate comes, um, they'll be on the ground there. Um, they've been doing incredible work um, in getting assistance and raising awareness about what is needed and getting those tools to those who need them. So um, they've been sending people out there. I think the group just left last week to really be hands-on, and they've been showing video recordings of what they've been finding and to keep everybody updated of um, the work that they're doing and how they can receive more supports um, to give it to those affected. So, you know, there's a lot of great work that's being done in the community to really ensure that uh, the same people are supported and, you know, that what's going on there, the country to the same narrative, you know, is learned. I know that's something that, you know, particularly since Katrina, we've been very adamant about ensuring that the people are not forgotten. Um, when it comes to um, particularly hurricanes and other natural disasters. So um, these efforts are a part of that a narrative to put disability on the forefront and ensuring that um, those within power and those who want to assist do right by the community and know how they can be a part of that. Exactly. So I want to make sure that we um, 
you know, we're going to have links to the NCLB and the other like-minded organizations as well in our uh, show notes. So please check those out and give if you are able. Um, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't make mention of the fact that the Virgin Islands were affected by uh, all of these hurricanes in succession as well. And uh, we're going to also provide the show notes separate from the Puerto Rico donation funds. We're going to provide links to assist uh, with folks on the ground in the Virgin Islands as well. Uh, Let's get to what we're reading. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that what I am reading, or plan to read very soon, that I was made aware of, is Real Royals graphic novel called Black Girl Mania, the graphic novel, which uses Afro-Indigenous futurism and comic book conventions to highlight one of the most commonly misunderstood aspects of bipolar disorder, mania. And the goal of this graphic novel from Brio's own words says that it is to offer a representation of bipolar disorder and neurodivergence that is neither demonizing, overly sympathetic, nor fetishizing, and that centers people of color, particularly black families. Um, She is known for her work that centralizes black and brown women and families, um, and as somebody who, you know, with the Miami Advocacy Work focuses on the experience of black women and families, this is something that I plan to support. Um, you know, it's very important, particularly for those who have um, invisible disabilities and invisible disabilities that are heavily stigmatized, such as bipolar disorder, to really have um, art, books, writings, you know, films, etc., cetera, that um, tell the story in a way that is not, as she mentioned, they're not stereotypical or demonizing or harmful. And particularly when it comes to disabled people of color, we especially, in some ways, are incredibly thirsty and, you know, hunger for those uh, images, for that representation. Since um, usually when you see disability stories being relayed, it is of people who are white, uh, particularly white male, uh, cisgender, um, so it's really very um, powerful to see a family like Bria um, really write something that fills in an incredible gap that is long overdue to being filled. So I really um, plan to get this graphic novel to support her work and to really support um, black families you know, and other same people of color who have a post disorder and to really shift the narrative when it comes to this particular disability to a way that members of that community uh, want it to be heard and known about. So um, we'll support Black women, Black families, and their work, um, you know, and, you know, buy it. If you can't buy it, share it. Let people know who you feel that would benefit from reading it. You know, let them know that um, about the creatives that exist in our community and what they're doing to shift the understanding of who we are in our lives and make it so that it's inclusive for everybody. And you can check out and get uh, Bria, Reels, Bria Re- Royal's book, um, Centering uh, Black Femmes and Black Women, um, at uh, www.brioroyal.com forward slash black hyphen girl hyphen mania. Uh, highly recommend checking that book out. Melissa gave it a, a roaring uh, introduction, and uh, you can pre-order it on our Brea Royals website, and uh, I look forward to reading it, um, as I know, uh, Melissa, you do as well. Yes. So uh, that's going to be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, this other thing that we're reading, I think uh, we both read it so, so far now, is an article in the New Republic about uh, the work that ADAPT was doing, um, titled Arrest of, Arresting uh, Disabled Bodies. Uh, this is the second recent action that ADAPT has done uh, going to going on the hill and uh, intentionally getting arrested to highlight uh, the um, who's most affected by uh, stripping Medicare and as we touched before uh, the health care bill. So um, obviously we have friends uh, and uh, folks we care about who are involved in ADAPT's work uh, and uh, we want to make sure that folks understand because I'm going to be frank uh, there are there are organizations right now. Uh, that are taking a lot of the credit 
for mm-hmm. killing Graham Cassidy that didn't lift a finger and went on the front lines. I'm looking at you, Indivisible. I'm looking at you, American Progress. I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at some of these other organizations that recently were written about um, that are in this whole resist space, right? And Adapt is an organization that has been resisting for 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 years, if not decades, mm-hmm. and it has more to do with lived experience as a resistance than resisting because of who's in office, right? So when you have these organizations that sprung up because 45 came in office and aren't really, besides sending out tweets, and yes, sending out tweets to have people call their legislators are effective. Mm-hmm. But then in contrast, when you see adapt activists getting erect, arrested on the Hill and there's not empathy placed on those folks, but there is, um, they're being propped up, and we talked about this in previous episodes, as inspiration, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and what aggravates me is there's an article written recently, and I'm not going to highlight it because it doesn't deserve it, but there's an article written recently that highlights the, um, some of these resistance orgs doing, quote-unquote, all of the work <laughs> as it relates to killing Graham Cassidy. When, again, they weren't on the front lines physically on the Hill doing this resistance work. So often we see, you know, um, Twitter is not activism. Uh, You know, uh, you have to be, you know, you can't call yourself an activist if if you're not active. And while those two statements are incredibly ableist, um, Mm -hmm. when disabled people actually, who under normal circumstances would be behind a computer and wouldn't be have the capacity to, go to the hill and they but in contrast they actually are showing up and getting arrested on the hill and you have these um able-bodied folks who aren't Mm -hmm. what does that say about their activism right so again i'm not going to shed light on that ridiculous article that was written you know praising american progress and praising indivisible for their minimal effort because we're not because this podcast is not in the business of a giving cookies to organizations that do minimal effort or b giving organizations that um, or individuals, um, any kind of praise um, over uh, marginalized people. We're just not in the business of doing that. That's, no. that, that. That is the exact opposite of why this podcast exists. Right. We are not about that life in any shape or form. <laughs> um, exactly. You know, and it's really frustrating, you know, what you're saying about the inspiration thing. You know, like you said, the same people have been, been doing this way before social media, uh, putting our very bodies on the line, you know, you know within every movement. The same people are there, whether we are seen or giving credit or not. And it really frustrating that yet again, you know, these groups are taking credit when they should not be. And, you know, online activism is just as powerful, if not in some ways more than having boots on the ground. Um, you know, if, if it wasn't for, you know, online activism, you know, I don't think that we would have be able to keep, you know, these repeal bills from occurring. You know, I think that, you know, getting people tweeting out things, getting people information as to what they need to do to contact their um, representative, you know, let people know when's the next um, rally or march or protest going to be, getting them organized online, you know, sharing media footage of those protests. That's powerful. That cannot and should not be dismissed at how powerful it is and sending the message to our representatives that we are not going to be idle or be docile to your BS and to your failure to really hearing the voice of the people who you work for, who you should be serving and not have the ears of lobbyists and, you know, um, special interest groups that want you to fill their agenda. So I really think that we need to really respect and thank people within ADAPT and people outside of ADAPT who have been doing this work for, you know, almost a year now in getting the issues to everybody so that they can understand why they need to pay attention, how it affects disabled people immensely, and, you know, how to get involved in their efforts, how to support their efforts. I know that um, there's one particular adapter, um, Anita Cameron, who... You know, Anita has been doing this work longer than I've been alive. She's been arrested over 130 times, you know, and she's out there putting her black disabled female body on the line for me, for you, for us, you know, and 
you need to thank her. You know, you need to thank everybody that's doing that type of sacrifice to protect your freedoms, protect your rights, to keep health care and other um, policies intact the best way that they can be and to improve them and not destroy them. Um, so you know, being disabled means being political, means being activist in some way, shape, or form. And there's no hierarchy of what's better activism than others. Any type of activism is activism, and it's important, and it's one step closer to protecting what is right and getting our voices heard out there, whether you're on the ground or you're online. You know, so I really think that we need to, you know, be very mindful of that kind of, you know, that tug of war as to what's real and what isn't, or what's important activism and what's not. It's all matters at the end of the day, um, particularly now in the times that we live in. Every bit of activism that you do matters. You know, so I really think that what ADAPT has done, you know, particularly this summer, in getting media coverage, you know, and also standing firm into ensuring that they are not, you know, overlooked and the credit is not dispersed to other people has been so important in ensuring that, you know, the right people have their names and history and get the credit that they um, undeniably deserve um, throughout this fight. So, um, you know, that article just really, to, to me, brought home you know, um, you know, this quote from it said, every arrest, every dragon, every shout displays strength and not weakness. Um, and I think that we all have to find the strength to keep fighting, you know, regardless of what you decide to do, you know, for what's important. And I think that ADAPT has been the leader in showing us that the fight continues and how to keep fighting after every fire that you think is put out, there's another one that has cropped up. And on that note, <laughs> thank you for joining us for another week of Wheeling and Dealing, and uh, we will see you all real soon. Yes, thank you for listening, and you know, look for you for the next one.